Um, yes, so we're going to be chatting to you about producing an engaging research poster. Um, I am uh, Heather McKenzie and uh, I do work in the Doctoral College at the University of Southampton uh, and I also have an academic background so I've been involved in um, producing research posters and also viewing them uh, at a variety of conferences, very small national ones and, and large international conferences and have seen a range of posters <laughs> uh, from fantastic to uh, slightly less than fantastic. Uh, uh, and yeah, Jonathan from our digital learning team uh, is joining me today as well. So we're going to, to co-run this uh, together. Uh, next slide, please, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the two kind of key things that we want to cover with you today are the kind of key design principles. So how do you make an engaging uh, poster that's not just engaging and eye-catching, but also uh, sensibly communicates about your research? Uh, and then we're also going to talk to you about how do you talk about your research uh, and how do you talk about your poster? Uh, so I'll just hand over to Jonathan, who's going to start uh, with the first section of key design principles. Thank you. Um well, you have about three seconds to catch somebody's attention. The world around us is filled with advertising on billboards, on the side of buses or bus shelters, outside shops, on social media. But how much of it do you actually notice, despite the best efforts of all the advertisers? We often just don't spot it and we move away. And it's going to be like that, um, particularly at a physical event, um, where you've got to attract somebody's attention. If it's an online event, they're more likely to have sort of signed up and come to watch you. But nonetheless, you've still got a very short time in which to attract somebody's attention and get them to want to know a bit more uh, about your poster. And you're there to publicize it and generate uh, a discussion. And um, so you need to make sure that you really do attract them and draw them in. And therefore, as you've been hearing in the other presentations this afternoon, you need to make sure that your subject and your purpose are very, very clear. Now, I've put out uh, a little padlet in advance for none of you to go and look at, and many of you have been looking at that, and I've been looking at some of the feedback. It will still be available after the session if you want to go and look at some of the posters. But people have been drawing out in those posters what they like and what they feel is, is less effective about them in making sure that people can understand the purpose and the subject uh, of those presentations you need to make sure that you know who your audience are. Again, that's been stressed on a number of occasions, giving presentations, that sort of information you've had earlier on uh, from Sarah and from Nicola. It's making sure you know who your audience is and therefore targeting your message at that audience in terms of the scope, the depth and the content that you're going to include. Now, this is one of the posters that we put up on the a padlet uh, for you to look at and you'll see in here that this is perhaps a rather different structure. I'm not saying this is perfect, but there are a number of things I'll talk about later on, but this is a kind of a new style of poster that people are tending to quite like in the scientific community. It's in the middle, I will put my message as a bullet point or two, a couple of very clear sentences that just say, here is my message. This is particularly designed for when you'll be there at a physical event. Down the sides are further information that you can talk about if you need to, the methods and results that Sarah was talking about. But the main central point is given in the middle. And that's a, a really strong kind of message of saying, this is the key message I want you to hear about my research. It could be at an early stage about what you're planning to find out. It could be at the end, the conclusion that you have reached, the key finding that you've that you've made uh, within your research. So that's a, a, a route to think about is, do you really want to grab somebody's attention? Yeah, there are other things here. Some of the color contrast isn't great. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. But that's the first key thing is getting your message across. A key message here then is really in your writing and your text is keep it big bigger is in many ways better. You need to make sure things can be seen and can be read. Titles, something like 72 to 100 point. Now this is broad guidelines. You'll need to look at your exact uh, scenario, 
but something like that for a big, bold title. You're normally writing in 10, 11, 12 points, so that's a lot bigger, but it really does need to be. Just think about signs as you drive along a road where someone's trying to write up a handwritten sign and you go, well, you're trying to get a message, but I have no idea what that is. It's just so small. I just can't read. I can't see that sign. The content is lost. So you do need to make sure things are big. Then headings within the poster, something like 36 to 44 point, big and bold, clear. Body text, 24 to 34 point. I think the most common comment about the Padlets was, I just couldn't read the content. Either graphically it was too small or the font was just too small. Um, and it just doesn't allow people to, to plug in, read the content and get interested. And they just lose interest and move on to a different event or different poster. You want to keep paragraphs short and you want to front load those paragraphs. You need to make sure your paragraphs are short and pithy. They bring all the information out quickly. Within that process, you want to make sure that they are 50 to 75 words and align things to the left hand side. Although things look nice when they are fully justified, most people find left justified text easier to read. It creates a ragged right hand end, but actually it speeds reading up by about 15%. As it says there, you want a strong contrast of your text on the background to again make it easy to read. Now a point to make with that is the world that I work in digital learning is helping academic staff to produce better learning and uh, we all know how to abide by what is called WCAG, uh, W-C-A-G, uh, which is basically uh, agreed web con uh, uh, accessibility regulations and there for example uh, we have to make sure that our text to background is at a ratio of three to one or 4.5 to one depending upon what level of those regulations we're trying to work from you may then wonder what on earth does he mean by that well let me just give you a demonstration uh, there's a piece of software uh, called the color contrast analyzer cca and color contrast analyzer allows me with a little pipette to click onto my text and click on my background and it will tell me automatically whether the contrast is high enough to meet those regulations. So it's really important that you do create that contrast. And again, as has been mentioned elsewhere, you must take into account things like color blindness in, into that kind of mix. I'm colorblind and I struggle with many combinations. Be careful with your choice of fonts. I'm not gonna tell you what font to use just be careful that again it's clear, it's readable, suitable for your subject area. A font can give a message about your content and about you. You need to make sure that it is definitely readable. A font that I would say never go with is Comic Sans. Comic Sans generally gives an impression not just of informality but actually that the content is aimed at a, a very uh, a, a child-centric audience. And that's perhaps not what you want to go for. I understand that it does certainly uh, help some people who uh, have um, think dyslexia, for example, people who have dyslexia often find comic songs easier to read. There are other fonts that can also be useful in understanding the issues that fonts can create uh, for reading speed that you need to look at. Try not to put your conclusions in a small sub, you know, little postscript at the bottom. You might want to go through lots of content with your big headings and lots of sections, but your conclusions are really what your research is about. It's about saying, this is what I found, this is my conclusion. Don't put everything else in at the last minute, squeeze it in at the bottom. Make sure there's a bit of room for it. Now here's just another example from our Padlet. This example here, I like the choice of a lighter font and a dark background for the main heading. Admittedly, I'm zooming in here on a, on a screen, so it doesn't give the full justice to this. Choosing this consistent background means you can choose a single font color to work on that background. I'm not sure that I like the color of these 
boxes that highlight they from my mind make those lines the dominant feature on the page but i do like the strong color contrast here for many of these areas and it helps to unify the document again as other speakers have said this afternoon that sense of creating a unification that says this is all of a piece it isn't just a random collection of ideas this poster tends to get criticized because people don't know where to go on this document there's good contrast but it, it lacks a bit of uh, direction in there but there is strong contrast and there is generally a theme to it the color themes work but there are other issues with it by the way if i seem to criticize all these posters hey you know what no poster is ever going to be perfect but you can certainly improve things as we go along um, and these are just things to bring out key issues to think about as we go along this poster gets criticized just because there's just so much information font is so small uh, Sarah was talking on about choosing what to put into an abstract and that's the same theme for a poster what is important that you must bring out another point to just make with this poster is what poster size is this if I'm going to ask for this to be printed somewhere this isn't any known standard poster size it's not portrait it's not landscape it's not a0 a1 a2 It'd be quite hard to get this printed or printed on another poster size and then trimmed down so i'm losing space you should get guidance on that and make sure that you work within the guidance you get so those are some clear ideas about making your purpose clear don't make the the layout on the color schemes confuse things for your audience we need to make sure there is structure and flow and I'm going to hand over to Heather now to talk a bit about uh, this. Lovely, thank you. So yes, uh, as Jonathan said, you, you need to be able to, to use the design of your poster, not only to grab people's attention, but also to, to make it easy for people to engage with your poster. Uh, and in, on a similar vein, the structure and the flow of the poster is a key tool that you have uh, to help people to understand how to navigate through your poster and how to engage with it. So once you've actually um, really got their attention and they really want to look at your poster, how are you going to maintain their attention and get them to understand what the key message of your poster actually is? Uh, next slide, please, Jonathan. Thank you. Lovely. Okay, so looking at this example uh, from the Padlet, um, you can see here that the, they've used several devices to help you understand the flow of the poster and and really what you want to do is to make sure that uh, somebody doesn't uh, get grabbed by the design of your poster uh, and then realize when they get there that they they don't really understand where to start with your poster and and rapidly lose interest so how do you maintain that interest that somebody has got uh, from that kind of initial attention grabbing uh, design uh, so there are key devices really that you can use here um, and you know as Jonathan says there's no such thing as a perfect poster and there's also no you know hard and fast rules for how you design your poster um, but there are some good devices that help you uh, help people to know where they stand and, and how to move through the information you've presented so one key device is uh, using columns uh, or some posters will use rows um, and these are really helpful because um, that's how we tend to read. <laughs> that's how we tend to read books. That's how we tend to read uh, written information. Uh, so we'll, we, we're used to working with columns and moving from left to right. So that can be really useful. Um, the other thing that people uh, commonly use and can be extra helpful is actually just the use of numbered headings can be so helpful and often overlooked uh, in terms of just clear navigation through. Uh, so, you know, once you get to the bottom of the left hand column on this poster because of the numbering that you're moving up to the top of the right hand column and then down again before you reach the, the discussion box at the bottom. Um, you might be able to use coloured sections uh, to indicate particularly salient points. So you can see in this poster they've used grey to highlight salient points. I would say that's a good device when used sparingly um, <laughs> and when used consistently, so not lots of different coloured boxes all over the place. Um, and also you might find that if you're using uh, rows in your, in your poster, that actually some use of light colour shading can be helpful to distinguish the, the different rows of your poster, although you'd hope you didn't have too many. <laughs> um, okay, so yes, again, the numbering can help you to understand how you go through the poster. 
um, really helpful tool. Um, and then a final sense check, really, as you're looking at your poster, um, really think about, yes, the flow makes sense to you. Is it going to make some sense to somebody else when they're viewing it for the first time? Um, and as I said, all of these are kind of key devices to help you help your audience engage with your poster. You can be more creative. Um, certainly, you can be more creative about the presentation of your poster uh, generally in, in design terms. Um, but if you're going to be creative, you need to then be very clear that the flow and the structure of your poster is clear uh, to your audience so they know uh, what they're doing with your poster. Um, so this poster, you can see, again, is an example from the Padlet. Um, and you can see, actually, it's not necessarily initially clear when you come to the poster if they've taken a columns or rows or, or what kind of approach, but the numbering makes it unequivocal uh, that you know which way you're moving to your poster. And generally speaking, it's reading across and then down, which we're all used to doing. Um, this poster, in contrast, perhaps, um, uh, is a a lot more difficult to engage with. So there's lots of different colors going on here. Um, there's not quite a columns approach, I don't think, or perhaps it is, uh, it's perhaps you're zigzagging across uh, in rows. Um, it's not immediately clear. There's no numbering to help you find your way um, and the colors don't necessarily seem to mean anything uh, necessarily. So that's, whilst it might be quite attractive uh, to, to throw a lot of information on your poster, you need to um, really signpost that. Um, another kind of point on the flow and the structure is to make sure you have clear in your mind what the flow and argument actually is before you start to build your poster. So you know, note that down. What are the key sections I need to put in my poster? <laughs> what order do I need to present those in? Um, and how am I going to do that? And if you're finding that difficult, and it often is difficult because this may well be the first time that you're um, presenting your research in anything other than a long kind of written report, um, then if you are struggling with that, then it, you, the most likely reason for that is you're trying to convey far too much information uh, in the poster. And so that's a kind of sign to pare it back uh, and think through just fewer sections, fewer points that you're trying to make in your poster. The, the other point that people make about this poster is I don't really know what the images are doing here. The images are too small. Are they associated with the thing on the left, with the thing on the right? Uh, it, it, those ought to be helping, but in here they they don't really get integrated particularly well with the rest of the content. No, I think also uh, there's the authors of the poster are missing. <laughs> So you don't actually know who is presenting the poster. It's not mentioned anywhere on it, unfortunately. And that's something you'd want to be um, very clear. Uh, thank you. I'm going to hand over now to Jonathan to look at contrast and colour check. I've mentioned this touch on a couple of times before, but I think let's just dive a little bit more into it. This poster here has gone with some shades of blue for headings, background in, in blocks, but not too much. And it just gives it maybe a slightly for me a slightly serene feel it feels unified it does feel like kind of, kind of a, a sense to it that it, it's cohesive the only area where it starts to break down is in the area with the multiple colors in here and that's always going to be a problem once you start using quite a range of colors it's very difficult to choose one color for the font that works it works well on a dark background, but not so well on the lighter shades. And some of these stand out better than others. Um, so that's a, 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 an important thing there of bringing through contrast and complementarity. And you'll find that there's a lot of that on kind of web design and posters and things like that. There's a lot of information on the web about people willing to talk with uh, you about design and look and feel in terms of what colors work. There are things called color wheels, for example, that show you which colors work together well in a group and what the contrasting colors for those often are. The one on the left has gone with a green look, but I think there are just too many shades there and it just becomes, for my money, a bit distracting. And again, quite difficult to spot some information in here. Um, again, on the right, we've then got Again, I think a unifying general theme. It struggles a bit in the middle with some of these areas, but again, they're trying to go with a, a uniform theme, but it depends upon your artistic integrity here. What you want to do with the artistic flair. This one has got some nice aspects to it. I do like the fact that it's quite bright, 
the one on the left is a bit pale and it's just depending on what you feel comfortable with you are the person that will be presenting and it needs to reflect part of you and your your research you shouldn't just dumb everything down to a level where you kind of go well that seems to be the common denominator i'll just live with that this poster here they've decided because they're working in optoelectronics and they research a lot about light they want this dark background with a light color and that might generally work but putting a picture as a background behind things and it's it's i think a duplicate of this picture which is in here already it just makes it really hard because you've got this color on the background and then they've had to make the words bold where they sit on top of that blue to make them work and then that becomes problematic when you start to edit the text it becomes difficult i can understand from their point of view of being a team that research is light that they like that contrast but it starts to cause other issues in terms of the general uh structuring there by putting a, another color not quite mid color but another color in that background starts to cause issues and then I have no idea what this heading here says, none whatsoever. Now, if you've got better color of vision than me, you might better see that a bit better, but that, that heading is entirely lost. But they followed other key bits of advice. They got it clearly numbered. They haven't peppered too many diagrams uh, onto the page. So color and contrast are important. They will give your document a tone and a setting and, and make it visible and accessible. We've had this phrase for a number of people so far, avoid junk. Anything that is unnecessary, get rid of it. You may feel that's really important. Is it really important? I think probably one of the best examples of choosing to get rid of unimportant things, only label what is important is the London Underground map. That map does not reflect what really goes on. These lines are not straight. You don't in fact need to know which buildings you've traveled underneath you just need to know that there is one stop between these two and it's at temple they don't bother putting other items on here because they're not part of the map now this map was designed way back in the 1920s but in principle has stayed there it's been modified at times but it just went for the let's give you the minimum information and the reason it's worked is because people just find it incredibly useful. It strips out a lot of unnecessary information. One of the only real, well, there's two key things there that, for my money, that it brings in. It tells you whether you're north or south of the Thames, because you can only cross that at certain points, and also which, which zone stations are in, so you know what ticket you need to get. That's the only other information it brings in. So really try to label only what is important. Minimise or remove what does not add meaning. Does it add meaning to your presentation? Does a graph tell the whole story? What if you hid bits of text? Again, Sarah was saying earlier on about making sure that you label axes, but what if you hid other things? Do they help the meaning? And you're trying to go for a ratio of 40 to 60% in terms of text to graphics. Now I can see some questions coming in, in the chat that they're talking about, um, you know, should we each other, you know, is it understandable with or without the, the author being present? Heather will talk about that a little bit later on about thinking about that as a, as a concept. It's a good question and we'll cover that a little bit later on. So here's a graph that I think is a bit over the top, really. I know Sarah said label uh, your axes, but I don't think I need to say these are decades. I could probably live without that. And the title tells me it's babies named Alice per million. So do I really need the word numbers of babies? The shading is dark. Do I need all of these lines? I could probably actually do a much cleaner, more open chart. And where should the title be at the top? That's what it's showing me rather than at the bottom. It's just looking at that kind of, of matter to just bring out what is salient from that chart. I didn't need all of the lines running across. I just needed these key marker points uh, on the axes you can tell i'm the social scientist in the room rather than the scientist per se good quality images if you're going to put images in they need to be of a good uh, quality and by quality i'm talking about the ability to be reproduced 
by your printers. So um, the university's uh, print center, for example, um, offer some pretty strong advice on what they think the level of um, kind of uh, image resolution should be. And uh, so their statement is it should be at least 72 DPI. Now, I would talk to other printers if you're going to go elsewhere, um, but that would be a good starting point because you're going to possibly stretch the image, make sure that your image has locked aspect ratio. You don't stretch it and distort your image. And your images should also include alt text, A-L-T, alternative text. So if I had, uh, say, a visual impairment and I wanted to be able to know what the content of your image is, there should be alt text. For example, in my presentation, this image on the right has alt text that says principles of design logo. So if there's text in the image that gives across a strong meaning, the alt text should give that text. If the image is making a key point, you need to explain what's in the image and what the point of the image is. So make sure that somebody accessing your content with a screen reader technology, and that's not necessarily somebody who is partially sighted or blind. It might be, uh, for example, Stephen Hawking used to use screen reader technology to access content. So you need to make sure you have good quality images that will print well. Talk to your printer about what resolution, what kind of DPI they want. Make sure you lock aspect ratio so you don't destroy your images. Keep original copies of your images so you can go back to them. You can take quality out, but you can't put quality back in. And to make sure all of your images contain alt text so they are accessible to everybody. I'll hand over to Heather, who has much more experience of actually delivering uh, presentations and research posters and content. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to talk through about talking about your research. And I think some of this will probably overlap with things or reiterate things that you've already heard so far this afternoon about talking about your search, about writing a good abstract. So I think it's important to highlight really that poster presentations uh, serve two key purposes. And I think we often think about the first one and pay less attention to the second one. Um, so they really are a great sales pitch for your research and or its implications. Um, it's a great chance for somebody to hear just a snapshot about your research, what are the key things they need to know, and what are the key implications. And again, done with the audience in mind. So if you're presenting to uh, a, a group of academics, you know that probably they're going to be interested more in the research implications and how your research sits into the, the broader kind of piece um, and research activity going on at the time. Uh, if your audience, say, is working in practice, then actually they might be interested more in the practical implications of what that means for them uh, and their roles in practice. And so thinking that through is really important. Um, but secondly, they're, they're a great opportunity for you to make personal connections. Uh, so whether that's other researchers who are working in your field or people who are working in practice or in industry or even future employers, it's a great chance for you to showcase your work uh, and for you um, and so this kind of has some key implications for how you both design your research poster and talk about your research. And I see that somebody in the chat has asked about whether your research poster should be understandable on, your, uh, on its own without the author presenting it. And I would say absolutely yes. Um, <laughs> and we'll talk about why uh, in a moment. But and so part of that means is you do need to be really clear uh, on your key messages. So what are the one, two, maximum three key messages you want somebody to take away when they've read your poster. Uh, be creative to stand out from the crowd, as Jonathan's already talked about that, three seconds to attract, whether people are looking at a, a kind of screen full of PDFs of posters and selecting some to have a look at, or they're walking into a big hall full of posters. They really want to, you really want them to see yours and want to go and have a look at it. Uh, if you do get the chance to um, stand next to your poster, if it's a, a physical conference or to talk to your poster, because you don't always get that opportunity, uh, when you do, make sure you come across as approachable and friendly. Um, and then finally, really consider how you can use your poster cr to create a continued relationship with the people you meet or those people who see your poster, whether you're next to it uh, when they see it or not. So. 
that means actually on your poster you can make space to specifically invite people to get in touch with you about your poster so make sure your email address is on there your twitter handle your project website if there is one uh, and your linkedin um, and not only add them on there but actually say to people i would you know we'd love it if you got in touch if you have any questions about your research we would be really happy to answer them and next slide please jonathan Thank you. Um, so again, as well as the kind of the design of your research poster, also in terms of what you're going to include in the poster and what you might prepare to talk about if you're going to be talking to your poster, you know, really thinking about your audience. So, you know, if you had to choose the most important thing you want people to understand about your research, what is that and how are you going to communicate that both in the poster and in the talk that you're going to give? Um, because with the best all in the world, you can include all of the information and detail and nuance that you might want to about your research uh, in your poster. But the more detail you include, the less people are going to engage with your poster. So if you want somebody to come away understanding your research, um, then you need to really think through what that most important key message is and how you're going to make sure people understand that. Uh, make sure you understand what the bigger picture is. So how does your research fit into the broader research landscape? And if you're communicating through your poster and through any talk next to your poster uh, with academics or with people from practice and industry, what's the bigger picture for them? What are the industry trends? What's happening in practice? What are the big things that people are concerned about? And how does your research knit into that? So that's likely something that you've not necessarily thought about in much detail just yet because you'll be in the, the nitty gritty of actually getting on with doing your research, designing your research, um, collecting and analysing your data. But now as you're coming to put together a poster is the time to then take a step back and think about that bigger picture um, and particularly think about why should people care about your research and why it's important and are there any practical implications. Um, now, actually, I realise that sometimes you will you will be presenting your research and you'll know the answer to some of these questions, but you might not know the answer to all of them and nobody's expecting you to. And, you know, a poster is a chance to talk briefly about your research and it's the start of a conversation, getting people interested in your research, then wanting to follow up with you later, then keeping track to see if there's ultimately a research publication that has all of that detail about your results in there. Um, but it's also a chance for you to chat to other people um, and find out what they think the implications are for their work um, related to your research. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the two main poster presentation formats. Now, ordinarily, or up until uh, 18 months ago, uh, we only really would talk about physical conferences, and now uh, all the conferences are, are online. Um, so I'm going to cover online conferences first, and then briefly tell you about physical conferences, because I think it's likely that online conferences, for a range of reasons, uh, will continue uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and conference organizers have been endlessly creative in how they organize uh, poster presentation sessions as part of conferences so um, nearly all of them include some sort of asynchronous poster showcase so that means essentially that there's a web page or there's part of the conference platform that features a pdf uh, of your poster uh, that people can go in and take a look at and read and and so because of that, actually, people throughout the conference period and maybe even after will be able to look at your poster and say yes to answer uh, Dave's question. It should be a standalone um, research poster that somebody can understand the key points uh, without having to have a conversation with you about it, because they may well be engaging with your poster uh, when you're not uh, there to answer any questions directly. Uh, other poster, other conference organisers have also in giving people the opportunity to include a short video of themselves talking to their posters. That would normally be around three minutes long, so that's really challenging. A very short period of time to convey um, the important information and again, as you'll have heard uh, several times already, that's about pairing it back into what's the kind of key things that you want to get across there. If I um, just, just step in very quickly there. Um, yeah. Heather, you, you in the doctoral college, you've run the three minute thesis competitions yes and that's a chance to kind of do the same thing as get up 
talk and say you've only got a very short amount of time to talk about your thesis and it's the same practice of abstracting and narrowing it down so any opportunity like that is a good opportunity to learn how to get out the unnecessary and focus on what you really need to say so any opportunity like that that isn't just poster related any charts to get up and talk is a good thing yeah absolutely agree and that that skill in particular you will use time and time again and actually and not just in oral communication when you come to write things up come to write abstracts knowing that you can pin things down um, that are important about your research in a very succinct and concise way is endlessly useful um, so those uh, poster presentations and options to include uh, short videos, they will sometimes also be supplemented by um, asynchronous chat. So there might be some Q&A chat channels, chance to post comments and Twitter chats, but that's not always the case. Um, and sometimes it will actually be a live on online pre presentation. So similar to this, somebody will have a slideshow with everybody's presentations, uh, posters uploaded and you will sit and wait your turn to talk to the audience and talk through in usually around three minutes uh, the key points of your poster so it might be that you get the chance to do that live or that you need to to record that as a video and it might be that you get the chance to uh, interact directly with the audience for your poster or it might not so i think the key thing there is making sure that you know what to expect up front and that you know, you've read through the guidance that have come from the organisers of the of the poster presentations about what is going to be expected of you and if you're at all unsure to get back in touch with them and ask for some clarification. Uh, so physical conferences uh, are <laughs> in some senses a little bit more straightforward than that, usually just a giant hall with poster boards up um, with your printed version of your poster and that would usually be there all day so again people can come and visit it even if you're not there uh, and then there'll be a time slot for you to go and stand next to your poster and either give a short presentation or just wait next to your poster, smile a lot and hope somebody comes over to ask you lots of interesting questions about your research. Okay, uh, next slide please. Okay, so just some practical tips really. Um, so whatever the presentation format, do check and double check the guidance from conference organisers. Um, so that you know whether you're supposed to be submitting a poster and or a video or whether you've got to prepare to deliver a live presentation. Um, if you actually need to have a, if you're going to a, a conference in, in real life, <laughs> so a physical conference, whether you need an A1 or an A0 poster, whether it should be portrait or landscape, um, so that you know you're taking a poster that you can actually display when you get there. Practice with a friend um, and be presentable. When it comes to an online conference, if it's possible for you to practice with the technology, then then do that. And certainly you should be clear if you're going to share your, your poster in a live session. Are you sharing your screen with your poster on it or is the um, conference organiser, are they going to put those together in slides um, and have your poster ready um, to present just so that you know. Uh, be creative in an online conference with how you connect with people. So. If you do have a chance for Q and A's around your poster live, then that's fantastic. And if, but if you don't, make sure that your kind of your poster and your chat makes it really clear you're happy for people to get in touch with you. You can use the chat uh, in poster presentation live sessions to kind of say, oh, they, he, don't forget these are all my contact details. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and in in, for some larger conferences, there's also a kind of Twitter hashtag for the conference, and that's actually a great chance for you to drum up interest ahead of your poster. You can use the, the conference hashtag, you can put a link to your poster wherever it is on the conference platform, uh, and you can then you know, use that as a way to network with people who have engaged with both your tweet and with your poster. If you're giving a live presentation to your poster, on an online conference, then just be aware of what's in your background. Um, so you might be thinking, focus so much on what you're going to say uh, and on the poster that you forget that actually your camera will be turned on wherever you are to give that. So just to give some thought to what's in the background. If you're going to a physical conference, take handouts. You can take just A4 versions of your poster along and put them in a little plastic wallet and pin that onto the board so that people can take that with them. So not only have they looked at and engaged with your poster, they have your contact details and, and a copy of your poster for later and um, take some business cards think about how your poster will travel is uh, a poster maybe a zero and your uh, hand luggage may be considerably smaller than a zero so how are you going to transport it 
um, and give your time yourself some time to get set up in the zone. Okay. Well, just quick, just just again, just quick little point there. For example, the University of Southampton Print Centre can print on fabric, and so they can actually produce a fabric version of a poster, which is way easier to fold up and iron out at the other end if you're traveling long distance than a long tube of plastic that may end up getting put into a, an aircraft hold or something like that. So it's worth again worth investigating what the possibilities are for, for things like printing because you want to make sure it arrives in good condition. Absolutely. So, sorry, Heather. No, I totally agree. Um, and if you are if you are not going to invest in a fabric version of your poster and you're going to print it onto um, thick paper, don't laminate it because uh, you will you won't ever use it again and all you end up with in my experience is a collection of, of rolls of laminated posters underneath your desk uh, so if you do take a poster tube and an a1 or uh, a0 paper version of your poster uh, don't laminate it and then when you're finished presenting it whilst it might hurt you a little bit you can pop it in the recycling at the conference venue and then just squash your poster tube up to go back in your in your um, suitcase uh, so either are good options, but the laminated one is, is not so great for the environment or practically. OK, next slide. OK, these are just uh, just a very final reminder, really, um, that don't forget when you're presenting your research poster or putting together a poster that you are then putting your research out into the public domain to a certain extent. So don't forget about things related to intellectual property for example it's worth checking if you have a funder or sponsor for your research check the terms and conditions around what you are and aren't allowed to talk about uh, related to your research if you're not sure just check with them and they'll be able to advise you um, also just you know check under their terms and conditions do they own any of the intellectual property from your research that they might not then want put into a public domain uh, equally, if you or uh, your supervisors start to suspect that there's there are elements of your research findings um, or research process and methods that actually you could exploit for uh, commercial benefit, uh, you then might want to be a little bit careful about what you put into into the public domain through your research poster. Um, so that's just worth thinking about if you think there is any commercial value. Uh, in your research, maybe uh, leaving some of the fine details <laughs> that might allow somebody else to commercially exploit your research first off of your research poster. Uh, and of course, if you have co-authors to your poster, then make sure they have at least some input to your poster uh, and definitely that they've approved it, the final version before you present it. Um, so I think really in summary, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's about making sure that your poster is a tool to communicate about your research, that it engages people, uh, that they want to find out more about your research, and then that your messages are so clear uh, that they have one sort of key takeaway from your research, and that you've used that opportunity really well to, to forge connections with other people who might, for whatever reason, be interested in your research and the ultimate outputs from that. Um, 